Welcome to the Newbie Real Estate Investor Podcast. I'm Jonathan Boyle with my co-host Joey Chan. Hey guys, we got some great news for you. So we just actually partnered with the Results Only Mentorship Program. Hit us up if you want more information. And today we have a special guest, Brandon Israel. Welcome to the show. Thank you guys. I really appreciate you guys having me. Excited. Thank you. We're so excited to have you too, finally. So Brandon, tell our audience a little bit about what you did before real estate and okay. how you got into real estate. Well, again, my name is uh, Brandon, like John said. Before starting in real estate, I was in IT slash telecom. Right out of college, graduated college, and landed a job, as we all kind of do, right, in the beginning. Then I was in for about 25, 26 years, and I, I, I loved it, I did love it in the beginning. But um, towards the end, I kind of worked for a smaller company. I don't, want, I don't wanna say it was a startup, but it was a smaller company. So I wore a lot of hats. So I had a team under me, all the way down to taking out the garbage, pretty much. Oh. Right. <laughs> so, but that's that's what happens when you run in when you join a small company. Yeah. Right. And it was more like a, a mom and pop type shop, but it kind of wore me out. Right. And I always knew that I wanted to get into uh, real estate, but I don't know about you guys, but uh, 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 the concept or the theory is that you need money to kind of get into real estate. And I don't know about you guys, but for me, that's what I kind of thought. And um, I was kind of looking to kind of exit the whole uh, corporate America thing. Yeah, um, not just IT, just corporate America, corporate period. Because yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm that type of guy, I don't like to be really told what to do. I don't like to be pigeon held and you come in at this time, you do this, clock in, clock out. That wasn't my gig. Um, so I kind of had, an exit plan um, to kind of get out of it. And um, I was just doing some research on how to get into real estate. And it just so happened, actually, let me back up a little bit. Before that, I was, my wife and I, we were looking for our primary residence. And obviously, you know, you hire a realtor. I think I told the story a couple of times. But we had found a property that we wanted and that we were interested in, but come to find out there was multiple bids or offers on the property. Yeah. So our realtor told us, said, hey, listen, if you write a letter or you reach out to the seller, you might be able to pull on their heartstrings, right, to kind of get you an upper hand for them to go with you. Sure. It's common so, yeah, yeah. I, oh, it is yeah, now? It's really common. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, so that, that's what happened. And unbeknownst to me, this was our first primary residence, so we, it, it, you know, a house buying experience is usually one of the most um, frustrating, frustrating, and one of the biggest purchases that you'll ever make in your life, right? Yeah. So it's not like we've been down this road twenty thousand times. So when he told me this, I asked my realtor. I was like, "Well, can you give me the information of the seller? Mm-hmm. Can you give me your contact information?" Yeah. Not knowing they can't, they can't give you that information, right? So what I did was. I didn't know it was skip tracing at that time, mm-hmm. but I dug and dug and yellow, pe- not yellow, white page.com, this person looked up until I found out their information, yeah. found out their contact, their number, their mailing address, oh, wow. <laughs> and sent them a letter. Now, we, we didn't um, get the property, but that's neither here nor there. But after that, my realtor was the one that told me, he was like, you went through all that to find the seller, yeah. to write her a letter to see if you want the house. She was like, he was like, I think you you would be good at wholesaling. Yeah. And at the time, I didn't know what it was. So he kind of gave me the backdrop as to what wholesaling was. So that's how I first kind of understood what wholesaling or just heard of the concept. heard of the concept, right? So fast forward, we, we I always knew that I wanted to get into it. So I made the exit strategy to leave my job. I went to my job, my boss, maybe like six months ahead of time and gave them a six month notice because I had a team that was under me. Mm-hmm. And again, it was a small company, so I just didn't want to give the standard two week notice and leave yeah. them in a, in a bad spot. So I gave them a, um, the six month notice and basically that's how I exited, long story short, that's how I exited out of corporate America. Mm-hmm. Gave them a six month notice and was done. Well, they fought me tooth and nail. They didn't want to let me go. Yeah. Um, he kind of talked me into staying longer than I was supposed to, which I was gonna finish out the entire year and not give the six months. I was gonna finish out the entire year. But just so happened, the stress of the job, 
on the six month mark, literally to boot. Now, mind you, I had told the told the guy that I was going to stay to the end of the year, yeah. April fourth, which made six months. It was I just walked out, went to my boss's office, and it was it was a big blow up, but um, because he was under stress, the company wasn't doing too well. He yeah. was it was just a lot of stress. So I went to him and just like, listen, I'm done. So April fourth of two thousand nineteen. Yeah, that was it. So it's been almost a year and a half. So that's the long story how I got into real estate. So Okay. So now that you're in real estate, you understand the concept of wholesale. Mm -hmm. How did you get more or less your formal training? Like how did you learn about wholesaling? YouTube University. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> YouTube and Google University, man. I'm just the type of person that I, I, I don't I never like liked formal training or um, and not to knock anybody that does it, um, you have to kind of get in where you fit in, right? If it works for you, it works for you. But I'm just the type of person that just learns on the fly or learn in the field. Mm -hmm. What they call it, OJ, OG, OJDB, whatever, on the job training. So I just um, kind of deep dove or deep dive dude and followed a couple of different people and honed in on the skill and just mastered the craft. So that's pretty much how I really learned it. Really? Wow. Yeah, yeah that's pretty interesting. interesting. Yeah, no, that definitely makes sense. Your your story, it, it although different, is yeah. slightly similar to mine in the sense where I learned everything on my own. Mm -hmm. But the difference is, instead of using YouTube, I use Bigger Pockets. Like I, I listened to I think at least over uh, over 150 of the podcasts before I actually like dove in and. I think it took at least over a hundred of them before I even thought of getting my license. <laughs> you know? Right. So, like, but yeah, that constant getting drilled to learn this information just helped, you know, to where we are today as well. Absolutely. So you're in wholesaling now, and I know you have a team now, mm -hmm. right? So I guess tell us from the beginning of your business what you did and what you did to bring it to where you are now. Well, that's a great question, John. A lot of long nights. Let me start there, right? When you're starting anything, it's more or less going to be um, you wearing multiple hats, right? So in the beginning, I did everything. It was just me. I was, I was earning a pretty good salary, right? But um, at the time, I had a new family, and I just, it, it just wouldn't have sat well to pull money out of the family to go start something that may or may not work, right? Yeah. So could I have dumped? A bunch of, or a ton of money into starting the business into marketing and things like that yeah I could have but it, again it wasn't just me and I had a family to support so I had to kind of um, burn both ends of the candlestick to start the business so again I was working in IT slash telecom so and a lot of that work was done overnight those people that may be watching that may be in the tech field they know a lot of migrations and cutovers and things like that happen in the middle of the night. You can't work on someone's network in the middle of the day <laughs> between yeah. 9 to 5. I would be burning both ends of the candlestick. I would be doing late night migrations and on one screen and on the other screen I would be up scrubbing lists that I had drove for dollars or kind of worked and pulled up manually from the county or whatever just to prepare to start calling on the next day. In the beginning it was just long, grueling. It took time. It took me eight months to get my first deal. So that goes to tell you that I had made a, reserv a mental reservation in my mind that listen, by any means, because remember, I had already made a decision to leave corporate America. I, I'm, I said I was done with it. So I didn't have a plan B. Well, that was plan B. <laughs> that was plan B. But I had already made a decision in my mind that I don't care how long it took um, that I was going to get it done. So to more specifically answer your question, it was driving for dollars, uh, primarily in the beginning that I was doing, um, start the business to get the to get our first couple of deals. So I would drive, take the long way to work mornings. And that's one thing I will say that I, that I loved about my job was the freedom, right? Pretty much as long as I got the work done and my team got the work done, there wasn't really too much um, micromanagement going on. So I could come to, come and go as I please. So in the mornings, um, I would probably get to work like around 10 o'clock or whatever. So eight o'clock in the morning, I'm out driving my neighborhood yeah. for driving for dollars. I would take a lunch like an hour or two lunch, right? Mm -hmm. And I would out driving for dollars, right? Okay. Coming home, no, I'm dead serious. Yeah. Coming from home, driving for dollars. Um, on Saturday mornings, I would get up just before the sun even cracked. 
I'm an early bird anyway, so I'm up usually like around five o'clock anyway, but I would be at the destination or the area that I was going to drive for dollars right. just before the crack, the sun crack. And I would do that until like one or two o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah, yeah. And I would get back home because I wanted to spend time with the family. And on Sundays, I really didn't do anything. It was just family time. But every waking moment, I would literally be working the business, every part of the business to get it. So fast forward up to now, um, it took time. Um, it wasn't something like I just out the bat just started hiring people. And again, I'm I'm not going to knock anyone that does do that. Different strokes for different folks, right? Yeah. yeah. But I, I I know for me um, that I wanted to scale this eventually. That I wanted to actually make this a company. So I wanted to learn every aspect of the business mm -hmm. before I brought someone else on, right? So we didn't actually bring anybody on until I think after our third or fourth deal. Okay. Um. And again, it was eight months for our first deal. Yeah. And then it was another three or four months till I got our second, my second deal. Because I was still, we were still figuring it out. So once we did that, after the third or fourth deal, that's when we hired our first uh, VA. And basically all he did was handled our transactions uh, coordinations. So once the deals were, meaning the purchase agreement between myself and the seller, mm -hmm. and we found a buyer, he would handle all of the transaction coordinating to get it to closing. So whether that's getting documents from the seller, mm -hmm. getting documents from the buyer, coordinating with the title company, get it to close, that's what he would do. And then after that, we just slowly started hiring more people. I would fire myself from a position mm -hmm. and hire more people. So right now, um, we're up to actually just hired a disposition. Dispositions guy should be starting next week, but we're about five people now, um, nice. five te a team of five. Yes. So that's how we kind of scale short story all these uh all these people are they all vas or is anyone local so my acquisitions and my dispositions that we just hired are local okay. actually local here to trenton, trenton. actually is that yeah where, is that where most of your deals are yeah we're, we're believe it or not we're in one county okay. in three cities within that county so mercer county mm -hmm. trenton hamilton and ewing okay that's what we do all of our deals just recently um ventured out to uh, gloucester city camden county but we're just testing, testing that market. Again, primarily it's just um, Trenton Hamilton. Really. We're here in your office, obviously. Mm. So when did you move into this office? And uh, I know we mentioned offline that this is actually Matt Faircloth's building. Mm -hmm. So how'd you get, get in contact with him? Like how'd this all transpire? So that's a great, that's a great story, actually. The day I left, the exact day that I left my job, I had an appointment. Um, to come in. I had already locked up the property under contract. Actually, right here on Center Street, maybe not even a quarter of a mile down the block. And we had blasted out the deal to our buyer's list. And Matt Faircloth was on that, on that buyer's list. His wife, Elizabeth, had reached out and said, hey, I'm interested in seeing that property. When can I see it? Or when can my husband see it? At this time, I didn't even know who Matt Faircloth was. Right. right? I'm, I'm still new into the game and I hadn't really watched Bigger Pockets or a Bigger Pocket podcast listener. I was more of a wholesaling ink. I don't know if you guys sure. you know yeah. Tom Kroll and those guys. That that's yeah. what I binge watched. Um, to your point, John. Elizabeth reached out and she was like, "I want to. We want to. We're interested in the property. Can we see it?" So I left the job that day, walked out, and came down to appointment. Matt Faircloth and his acquisitions manager had met me at the property. And they walked the property, basically saying it was too much work, but they didn't, they weren't really interested. But we got to talking, let me know who he was, what he did. He told me, hey, you should come and be a part of our community. And he said, I rent out space to investors. And he was like, you don't have to really do anything, commit to anything serious. We have what is called a community space where you can kind of pay, like, I think it was like 150 bucks a month. And it gives you access to the building to the conference rooms, to the printers, to the Wi-Fi, but you would kind of sit in an open space, open space pretty much. But I didn't take them up on that offer at that point in time because I was trying to save overhead. Sure. So at this point, at this time, I'm in the Starbucks, I'm in Panera Bread, I'm in Dunkin' Donuts, using that as my virtual office to work, right? But I would still see him periodically and he would kind of run me by the idea. So I had done, by that time when I joined, I was doing maybe about two or three deals a month. So it made sense, right? I, since I was doing deals right here in Trenton, you and in Hamilton, 
it would make sense just for me to have uh, some type of office space here. Right. So that's how I first got into this building, um, by Matt hooking me up and saying being part of the community. Yeah, and if anyone doesn't know who Matt Faircloth is, he's been on Bigger Pockets several times uh, as a guest speaker. Does a lot when it comes to real estate. So he's a pretty big name. I think he actually has a, um, a regularly running podcast on Bigger Pockets yeah. that he runs. Yeah, he's um, uh, can't remember the name of it, but it, it's I think it airs once a month or weekly. I'm not sure, but he he's a regular on on yeah. bigger podcast. He also has a book. It's um, I believe I, I, you know don't quote me on the exact name, but it's uh, raising pro private private capital. capital. Yeah, no, he's 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 um he's a good guy. He's a good guy. Yeah. So yeah, that that's how I got into this building. It's yeah. pretty neat. I mean, it's it's a nice space, you yeah. know. Um, the you know the open space is nice too. Uh, you know, it's it's kind of like the same concept that we we thought of, you know, and before we even came here. Yeah. For so, our own office yeah. Yeah. slash showroom. Yeah, John was telling me why. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's a good idea. It's a good idea. And I mean, I I didn't start in this office, right? Sure. I started, like I said, in the community open area. It wasn't that long. I think I came in April, and then a couple of months. It was by December, actually November, that I actually took a leap of faith and got the room because at the time no 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 of, oh, of last oh, okay. year yeah, yeah. Okay. of last year and it was a it was another investor of mine actually right next door because I was toying with the idea I knew Eric and those guys on there they were moving out of this room into the new room that you see down yeah. down the hall and this room came available and Matt was like Brandon you should take you should take this room kind of run out his space you don't want to fill those vacancies right yeah but uh, he was like, yeah, I think it would be a good idea if you take this room, Brandon. And I was like, yeah, no, no thanks, Matt. This one, this buck fifty right now is working. We're not about to jump up. And I was wrong. No, I'm not paying 400 I'm paying 600 I told you 400 Or was it you, oh, Joe? You no, 600 Um, It started at 400 Oh, okay. He gave me a kind of a, a price break and kind of gradually moved. He said, just take it and see how it works out, and we'll work, we'll work with you. Right? <laughs> um, but it was... Yeah. Yeah, no, he is. He is. It worked though, um, but it really wasn't him that made that kind of pushed me over the edge to take that extra step. It was another investor right next door, and I, I, I said, I said, hey, Danny, I said, what do you think? I said, you think I should take this this office? He was like, man, he was like, listen, if you don't take the chance or the gamble, you're gonna regret it. He was like, listen, you've already thrown all chips in. You might as well just throw all chips in and go in. And he's like, but I know you. You're not gonna fail. So that gave me an extra boost of confidence to go ahead and just take it. And as of uh, November of last year, that's when I took over this to, took over this room. So that's awesome. Everything was a step. Right. No, that's awesome because uh, that kind of reminds me. Uh, so kind of like a, what I was telling you offline uh, about our Garfield office. Yep. You know, showroom slash office. You know, like my attorney brought it to me. I went to look at it myself before mm -hmm. I showed Joey. And I was thinking about it. I'm like, what am I going to put in this? You know, like right. if I'm going to buy this. Yeah. Because I know down the line I wanted like an office space. Right. So I knew that it could be used for it. But mm -hmm. it was like 2,000 square feet on the first floor. And then if you finish the basement, it's probably another 1,000. Mm -hmm. So I was just like, what am I putting here? Right. But then I was like, oh, it could be Joey's kitchen showroom. <laughs> you know, like he does a lot of cabinets. Yeah. And... I remember then bringing him to it and kind of giving him a vision of it. Like, look, we could do this right, here, right. and then we could do this here, we could do this here. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, Joey caught on to the vision, and at first he was just like, oh, I don't know. But I'm like, yeah, let's do it. Let's go for it. Because it, it was a little far yeah. for me. Yeah. For me, it was about a good 40-minute drive. Wow, okay. So I was like, do I want my office 40 minutes from my house? Right. Because Right now, I'm working out of my mm -hmm. house office, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so it's literally two seconds, you know? <laughs> you get out of bed. Get out of bed, go right down, yeah. yeah. So, I'm like, hmm, I don't know. If you find something closer... <laughs> get back to me. Know, let me know. <laughs> so, you weren't originally on board. I, I was I was okay with it, but not as an office. Like, okay, I, I didn't... I was good as far as, like, the kitchen cabinet showroom. Yep, yep. You know, because I needed somewhere to put my displays. Absolutely. So I was like, okay, 
it, it could work. Right. Because it is Bergen County, mm -hmm. you know, people there who want to see mm -hmm. and, and feel, especially homeowners. Yep. You know, like, like right now, the, the majority of my clients are investors and contractors. Mm. And they're okay not seeing it because, you know, they order shaker white cab. One is the same as the other. Exactly. Exactly. So they really can't tell the difference that much. Right. And they just want to know how much is it mm -hmm. and when can you get it. Mm -hmm. That's it. They don't care that much about everything else. Right. Whereas the homeowner, they want to touch, touch it, and feel. Touch it, yeah. Feel yep. It. They yep. Want to, they want to know is it's you know is it carb too efficient? It, you know how where's the paint? Where's it made? Yep. What kind yep. of drawer glides is it? Mm -hmm. What kind of hardware? Yep. You know is it made in Germany or is it made in <laughs> China? Like they want to know everything. <laughs> so you know they end up paying more. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> We got to spend more time with them. Right, right. Yeah. E eventually, I got them on board for the simple fact, like, if we're going to scale, like, our own fix and flip, wholesaling, all this business, yeah. we need a space where we can do it. Yep. We can't really do it from, well, I mean, we could, but it's still a little bit more difficult yeah. compared to some other wholesalers we've seen who have office spaces such as yourself, you know? Like, we just thought the grander scheme to own it and to grow from there and yep. if we get too big then find another space mm -hmm. yeah that's a good problem to have yeah just and to have a central location because right now it's everybody's kind of working from home yep and there's no kind of centralized location you know if we have paper receipts yep where do we put it yep if we have files where do we put it mm -hmm. so everybody has a collection of half files right right, right. you got to piece them together one location yeah. every you know everybody accumulate their the files we yep. all put it in one filing folder yep everything's there you know and then we can scan it virtually mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. you know before that you know it's, it has to go somewhere physically yeah so yeah. that's that was the you know at least the vision yeah and then now actually another small perk that we didn't think about until recently is like in our basement where as funny as that sounds, in our basement, it's huge and, you know, has the height mm -hmm. like a, a regular first floor or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. But we're adding like our podcast room where, you know, we plan to do a lot of our, you know, filming for the future. Yeah, no, I, th I think that it's a, it's a good idea. I was under the same mindset when I first started out, too. I think that we get all enamored by that idea of waking up and out of the bed and just jump in, go three doors down, down the hall, and you're right there. Mm -hmm. it, it seems, I know for me, it seemed cool in the beginning, but then I wanted to get to that point where I wanted to separate work from home, mm -hmm. right? And I needed that. That's, that's the reason why I took, one of the reasons why, or one of the main reasons why I took Matt up on his offer was because I wanted a space separate for work, mm -hmm. and I wanted to keep home its own thing as well, right? right. So I know for me, I, I, I gravitated to it. Um, because now I can separate the two, mm -hmm. right? Um, I kind of have a, a stop time, even though it doesn't it doesn't really work all the yeah. time when you get home. Because when you work for yourself, it's really yeah, nothing. No turn it off. Time. Yeah. Yeah. I was I was watching a commercial. Uh, this guy Pace Morby. Pace. Know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Pace. He's a big wholesaler down sure. in Arizona or somewhere. Right. So he had a quick two-minute video. Mm -hmm. It was he was hanging out with his daughter. Yeah. He's like, my wife is showing a house. Mm -hmm. you know, two hours, and so I got the whole family. He's like. So, for us, there's no distinction between work Working and family. <laughs> you know, yeah. For him, yeah. right? Yeah. So, I, I kind of do because my wife is not as involved in right. the business. She's more help, helping at home, taking care of the kids. Same. You, you know, but yes, she is involved in terms of, you know, big decisions. Mm -hmm. Of course. You know, you got to consult. Yep. Right? Absolutely. Otherwise, you know... <laughs> Another subject. Roll, roll, on. Yeah, yeah. roll on. I get it. I get it. <laughs> Say less. Uh, let's kind of uh, drill down a little bit. Yeah. Right. You were doing driving for dollars mm -hmm. at first. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when did you kind of transition out of that, and what was kind of the next strategy? Like, because because you you know like all right, driving for dollars mm -hmm. takes up a lot of time. Mm -hmm. After you take up that time, you realize, hey. I can't really scale this because mm -hmm. I'm just driving around by myself. Yep. Right? At, at what point did you start going into a different type of strategy? Um, I would say probably after that first year. Because again, 
the first deal, it proved the theory that wholesaling actually worked. I've seen other people doing it, but it doesn't work for me, yeah, yeah. right? So that's what I did in the beginning and I kind of continued what was working um, just to kind of prove and finish proving to myself that it was sustainable. Mm -hmm. So after that first year, I knew, to your point, I knew it wasn't scalable. Even though I did try to hire uh, for about two, it lasted for about two months, mm -hmm. try to hire drivers. Yeah to go out and do the driving for dollars for us. I was driving Uber and so I was hiring Uber and Lyft drivers to kind of drive neighborhood. At first I gave them the criteria that I wanted them to kind of look for in properties. Right. Um, that didn't work out too well. I guess people don't pay attention or they don't follow directions uh, yeah. very well. Um, even though it was a very simple task, these guys were going around snapping every, just anything, just brand new renovated houses and um, like, and the app that I was using was Deal Machine. So I, at that time, I think I was on the lowest grade plan. It was like 40 cent a postcard. So these guys out here snapping pictures of properties that are listed with realtors. The signs yeah. are right on the front of the house. And right. I'm like, oh, Jesus Christ, man. <laughs> what is going on? So we kind of quickly let that go after about two months. After I found it wasn't scalable, what I did was being that I identified that the market that I was in was primarily a, renters, a rental market, I kind of thought to myself, okay, since I'm going to be marketing to tire landlords, why don't I just go and pull lists um, based upon um, the date of purchase? Yeah. Um, so when I found that out, and that, that before that, I was also monkeying around with pulling lists directly from the county. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't primarily start messing with the third-party data houses just because it was at that time, three years ago, those lists were crazy. I think they were like 20 cent a record or something like that. Now they're like dirt cheap now. Yeah. Like six cent a record or something, like some crazy, three, three or four cents. Yeah. yeah. But three, four years, three years ago, it was kind of expensive. So I wasn't going to the list sources and all these yeah. third party data houses. I was going directly to the county and pulling it for free. Here um, in Mercer County, you can pull pull Excel spreadsheets directly off of the, um, the county's website oh, wow. um, of data on different search criteria and, and points. Um, data that you can pull. So that's what I was doing. So now that I identified what uh, target I was going after, I pulled those lists and then kind of had the cold callers cold calling them. I was cold calling in the beginning. And then if I didn't reach out to them, I would then set them up on a postcard drip campaign from, um, from Deal Machine. So I would upload that list or have the VAs put the list into Deal Machine and have them sent postcards. So, and that's what we do still to this day, right? I'm a, I'm a big believer in keeping it very simple. Um, I'm always open to new ideas because things change. Technology changes, things change, right? Yeah. I just stick with what's working. So right now we're just strictly um, cold calling. And then if we don't reach them by cold call, we'll reach out to them via the, uh, the postcard. So that's what we're doing now. Nice. Um, that's the main marketing. So what, what are you guys saying to them when you cold call what what is like give me a sample script okay i'm the landlord you're calling me you know what what are you telling me to convince me to sell you the house so, <laughs> so, no 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 listen listen <laughs> and i'm glad that you, you you brought that point up and you is and you specifically use that word convince right and this is where i may differ from a lot of people Right. I know a lot of the gurus and the guys out there to teach you the 10,000 and ones rebuttal to every no or whatever or kind of salesman talk your way into buying. A, listen, from day one, I'm not that guy. Right. You all might think that I'm I love to talk. I do love to talk, but I don't like making people give me anything um, by talking my way into it. Right. I want you I want it to be a mutual benefiting um, thing, right? Whether it doesn't have anything to do with real estate in anything, right? If I want something, I want it to be mutual benefiting. So I kind of use that same concept in my business. So I don't, we, I, I never convinced anybody to sell me their house, right? I looked for those people that were truly motivated because you can't screw up a motivated seller right. if they're truly motivated. Yeah. There's no convincing needed. You, they identify your value, you identify their value or the value that you can bring to them, and it's a mutual benefiting thing, right? So we look for people that are truly motivated, that we can really help. I got into this business, yes, to make money, but to ultimately help people. So my script is basically, I try to hit four points, and I got this from giving credit. 
I, I got this from the Wholesaling Inc. guys, um, TTP, Brent Daniels specifically. I try to train my team, and even when I was on the call, on the phone, personally, I try to hit these four points. Price, timeline, motivation to sell, and uh, motivation, right? Those four points, I talk to those four points and really try to drill down on their motivation. Why are you looking to sell this property? Yeah. But again, me being in a rental market, I kind of really understand what their motivation would be. Motivated landlord is usually only motivated for one thing or one or two things, right? They've gotten their ROI or they're just tired of being a, a landlord and they don't want to deal with the late phone calls, the early phone calls to come clean this poop. I don't know if y'all seen my post <laughs> yesterday. Oh, <laughs> so they, that's usually one of the two reasons, right? Mm -hmm. They've gotten their money back. They just want to cash out. They're done with real estate. They just want to retire or they're tired of being a landlord. So we really kind of focus in on that mm -hmm. and let them know, hey, I'm an investor just like you, right? So there's really no selling point. They know I can't buy your property. I can't buy your property for retail, right? Mm -hmm. We talk the same language. So I kind of drill down on that and we make them an offer. That's it. And if it's not an offer that kind of fits what they are looking to do and what we need the property for, we move on. I don't sit there trying to beg you, prime you, tell you a million of reasons, million one reasons why I should be your buyer. Nah, I, I just don't. But we just, I just talk to the guys. I just talk to the, and that's with anybody, right? Even before I really settled down in on this market, because in the beginning I was, hold, I was trying to wholesale everywhere. I was in Atlantic City. I was in New Brunswick. I was up in Bergen County. I was all over the place, right? Even talking just to regular homeowners, that's not a rental market. It was just, just really having a conversation with them and really trying to understand what their needs were. Yeah, what is their motivation? And why would you call me back on a 40 cent postcard? right? You have to be in some level of destitute to call somebody back on a postcard, 40 cent postcard. We, we did that and we try to connect with them. That's it. That's really, that was really our, today I don't even, I don't even, honestly, Joe, I don't even have a script. Okay. Um, I gave my guys an outline, mm -hmm. um, my cold callers, I gave them an outline. That, of, that's really my question. Yeah. That, that's kind of really where, where my question is. You yeah. know, how do you train your cold callers like what what are you telling them to say to the sellers so again it goes back to those four points mm -hmm. right yeah i get it now but you know, yeah, yeah. at the beginning was yeah, it, it was just really just trying to let them know that we're not in the business to try to buy houses we're in the business of help solving problems right find a big problem that someone has usually the bigger and i found the bigger the problem the, the person has usually the bigger the assignment fee but the more gratification that we get as a company, I know I get that being able to help someone. So really try to drill down on why the people are trying to sell. Get the dollar out of, get the dollar amount out of your mind or I'm just trying to make a buck. The money is going to come, yeah. right? It's just a numbers game. You don't even have to worry about it. So yeah, that's how I trained my team. Um, I, again, I gave them a, a uh, not really a script, but a guideline to follow to really hit those key four po uh, four points, uh, four pillars. And I don't care how you get there. No, so that's, that's unique. It. That's yeah. unique because most people are saying, "Hi, my name is you know Joey, and I'm a local investor. Mm -hmm. I was uh, across the street. I saw your house. Mm -hmm. Whatever you know the case may be. And are you looking to sell? That's yeah. everybody's. That's the typical script, yeah. right? So. Yeah. You know, you're not doing that. Well, no, no, I mean, you have to do that in the beginning okay. to, to introduce okay. yourself. Yeah. Yes, that's that's what uh, I was getting at. But that's okay. that's that's an introduction. Mm -hmm. Right. But I train the team to veer off of that. Once you make that introduction, because these people don't know who you are calling them. Right. Yeah. So you have to make some form of announcement who you are and why you're calling. Why are you? Why are you calling me? I don't yeah. know you. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, yes, my name is Brandon Israel. I'm a local investor. I came across your property and we wanted to reach out to see if you were interested in receiving a cash offer. Right. Yeah. So, yes, that's their opening okay. line all script, right. if you will. Yeah. But after that, it's all a, just a human conversation, mm -hmm. really. Right. If they say, yes, I'm interested, what offer are you going to make? So now they go to those four points. Again, I don't care what order they hit, mm -hmm. timeline, motivation to sell, price, and uh, motivation. Did yeah. I say motivation? Yeah. Once they hit those key points and identify, that's it. It's, there's no script after that.
Right. So, Thanks. yeah. Out of curiosity, what's the difference between motivation and motivation itself? So, no, that that, that, that isn't. Yeah. Okay. So it's motivation, timeline and sale, price, and what was my last one that I said? Price, timeline, motivation, and condition of the property. Sorry. Oh, okay, got it, got it. So condition. <laughs> Sorry. So if I said that four, messed that up, those are the four <laughs> no, things. No worries. So it's condition. So, um, but again, the major one that you kind of need to try to drill down to, that's the one we care about, is the motivation. And we don't really look... Um, and I kind of steered away from it in the beginning as well. People like, if they don't know you, they don't feel comfortable with you. Mm -hmm. And I know we hear this word rapport all the time. Yeah, I, I hate that. I, well, I hate that word. I, I, rapport, I, what's this other guy's name? He's a big YouTube um, um, tuber. And um, when he mentioned this, it kind of resonated with me so well because I had the same kind of mindset. When you're building rapport, it seems it comes off fake sometimes, mm -hmm. right? It come, doesn't, doesn't come off genuine, right? So what I like to say is instead of building rapport, I train my team to build confidence in the seller that, listen, I'm, I, don't have to, I don't have to be your buddy, right? If we have some common things that we can kind of identify and relate yeah. to, that's great. But I'm not going to spend 15 minutes on the, on the phone talking about we have the same color cat, right? <laughs> or we went to, I, no. Listen, if I build confidence that I am your guy that's going to solve your problem, you don't have to like me, right? I'm going to build the confidence in you that I'm the right guy for this job. If you sign this contract, I am going to get the number that you and I agree upon, right? So the main thing that we want to focus on is the reason why. And people, if they don't know you and you haven't built that confidence yet, in the beginning they're going to give you some surface level reason why they're trying to sell. Oh, I'm just tired of the house. No, no. If you're just tired of the house, you can you gotta go and list it with the realtor, mm -hmm. right? That's not the reason why you called me on a 40 cent postcard and you want the cash now. You want to close in 30 days. So we really try to drill down as to the reason why, right? And it may take a couple of times. Yeah. You may have to circle and and, and lead the conversation and come back to it, or it may take a couple of phone calls. Not even on that setting. Maybe not on that phone call. It may be three, four two, three weeks later that yeah. you really kind of built that confidence up and you get to the real reason why. Okay, my son has moved from this state to go to college in Texas and I don't want to leave him by himself in Texas and me and my husband will feel better if we're right next to him, right? Mm -hmm. So, and school starts in September and it's July, right? right? Yeah. So now I've really found the motivation as to the reason why it's not, oh, you just want to sell. So now we can kind of really drill down and kind of serve them. So that's what I'm saying, the motivation is key. I'm kind of going back to before, uh, do you have any kind of favorite podcasts or books, audio books that you listen to? Yeah, I, I still believe it or not, I still listen to Wholesaling Inc. Okay. I still listen to it. It's something about hearing people's stories, right? Mm -hmm on how they got started. It, it's still fascinating. So, Wholesaling Inc. Is, is, is a big one. I'm, I'm always reading, reading um, new books, you can't see it over there, but reading investment books, um, how to get better in the craft, and kind of evolve from wholesaling. And I'm talking about specifically books in, re in, in regards to uh, real estate. Even though wholesaling is my foundation, mm -hmm. and I'll never stop wholesaling, ever, sure. ever, ever, ever. Listen, it's the best way. I think if you learn wholesaling, this is for any investor. If you learn wholesaling, you can always source your own deals, right? Yes. Yes. You can, you, you don't have to need, you don't need a realtor. You don't need to come up with these crazy ways to try to find deals. You can always source your own deals at any point in time and you can cherry pick the best ones for yourself. Exactly. Um, so I'm always trying to evolve in uh, real estate. So I'm always reading real estate books as well. You have a few rental properties now. You have seven mm -hmm. units, and you mentioned that you basically paid all cash for them. Yep. Uh, can you, I guess, because I know your strategy is different than, I would say, a majority of mm -hmm. all of our other, you know, previous podcast uh, yep. guests. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate on that and why you do that? So, yeah, and like you said, we had the conversation offline. Um, but yes, we have about seven doors now, um, and we acquired all of those properties by using um, the cash that we generate from wholesaling, mm -hmm. right, to buy the properties in cash. So that means no private money, no lenders, no banking institutions. No, it's hard cash, cold cash that we purchase these properties in. And 
The reason why I do that, and again, um, as I stated to you guys earlier, I'm getting fought about, the, I'm getting, I have fights about this conversation right. with uh, more seasoned investors, but this is just where I am right now in my comfortability level. I don't like to owe anybody anything, right? And, and I know there's a good, th there's, a, there's a thing, um, leveraging and good debt versus bad debt. Um, if you take out a mortgage on a property, that's good debt. So in your level, I get all that, right? Or I'm getting all of that. I'm learning that portion of it. But just the, ver the, the fact of owing somebody something if the market crashes, right? And we all know the market does this, right? So it, 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 at some point, it's inevitable, right? That it's going to take a dip and it's going to, you're going to have to know, learn how to navigate through that. But my comfortability factor or level at this point in time is if that does happen, and again, it's going to happen, I don't owe anybody anything. I don't have the bank screaming down my neck for a mortgage payment. All I really have to worry about is those taxes that are due to the uh, local municipality uh, for those properties. And, in, and being it's in a rental market, those taxes are fairly low. The average tax um, taxes on a property here in Trenton is maybe about 13, 1400 bucks, right? So exactly and that's for the year that's for the year right <laughs> so my property can sit vacant for all i care i'm not stressed out i don't own nobody i don't have to worry about how i'm gonna make this mortgage payment and that's kind of where i'm at that's the reason why I'm, I'm i'm utilizing that strategy now but who knows some some in the near future i may when, when, venture when out ready to expand. i'll come, come, <laughs> come see you <laughs> come, me, come see you and john y'all point me in the right direction <laughs> So yeah, that's awesome. that's where we're at. No, no, that he knows people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right here he does. Yeah. But you know that, you know that makes perfect sense. You know, especially at the price points and everything like that. Yeah. Um. So I guess that kind of brings me to probably one of our last questions. Okay. Um, what's the best piece of advice you got when you got started in real estate, or what's the best piece of advice you would give to someone getting started? I just had this conversation on um, in my group. I would say to anybody that's just starting out, and this is not just in real estate. Mm -hmm. If you're just learning a new thing, right, and you want to get involved in a new thing or a new venture or whatever, do as much knowledge, information gathering yourself. Learn as much as you can about that topic or that um, venture that you're going into yourself, whether that is Google, whether that's the internet, whether that's YouTube, whether that's um, talking talking to somebody, um, but I, I would even kind of veer off from that last point of talking to people because we tend to like to try to pick people's brain and for them to give you all of the answers, right? I would say learn as much about the topic and specifically about investing in real estate, learn as much as you can on your own first, right? Then seek out that next extra step or that next extra help, whether that's finding a mentor or um, going to different investment groups and things like that. But because what I found is a lot of people, people are just lazy, right? People, they, they, I don't know if it's just, if it's our generation or it's just the, the younger group, they want everything handed to them, right? Without having to do the necessary work previously to get into something, right? So yeah, that's, that's, that would be my takeaway. Learn as much as you can first about the industry. And then and then kind of go from there. Oh, that's great advice. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Brandon, you know, thank it you was, very much. No, it was no great problem. Speaking with you, man. You're nah, great. I appreciate you guys. Uh, time and nah, I appreciate you guys yeah. coming down, man. Thank Next you. time I gotta come up, and I yeah, gotta do, we gotta do lunch or something. I gotta get you guys lunch. Take care, everyone.